Welcome. Welcome so much to this uh, live event session. And my name is Matt Winder. I'm from the company Intense. And in the beginning here, I'll share uh, some slides with you. This live event is a joint uh, venture between uh, Consolidon and Intense. And we really want to inspire you. And in the end, we have some offers to you. And if you want to, to take part in these offers, you just have to fill out a small form and then you can have some takeaways that you can bring with you in your work. But just to start this, where are we actually with uh, this? Uh, our mission in Intense is like you see here, that we want to empower people and communities to go beyond when it really matters. That also means that I'm here not to be a consultant running your business. I'm here to be a consultant inspiring you to run your business. And that's actually very important. We want to empower people in sales and marketing to run the business in a successful way. But we also want to inspire them to go beyond, really create results that are amazing, but only if it really matters. And what do I re really mean by that? I mean that what I've seen a lot of times is that when you participate a session like this, you participate, but it doesn't really matter to you. This is very important that here we really want that it matters to you. That means if something really matters, I want to do a change. If something really matters, I want to do a change in my way of working. And what do I mean by matters? Let me give you an example here. Just yesterday, we finished the Olympics in Tokyo. These athletes have been preparing, not this time for four years, but for five years. Does it matter for them to participate? Yes, it does. Do they really want to go beyond? Yes, they did want to do that. Did they all win? No, they did not. But one thing is for sure, they all participated because it really, really matters for them to do it. Sometimes we should look at sales in the same way. Does it really matter for us to create the best result, the greatest customer satisfaction? Or are we sometimes just having a work with a paycheck and it doesn't really matter to us? That's also why what I'm gonna do today is I wanna inspire you to see how can you go beyond and how can you create an amazing, an amazing sales and marketing organization that really creates the best possible results in, in your business, your industry. So we could learn a lot from these athletes. I know that your business is of course different and I know that they're doing something, but they do this also because they're so passionate about it. So we could learn from athletes. How do they train? How do they practice? And we can also learn that something has really changed. Look at this. I know that yesterday it was announced that Messi now changed Barcelona, and that's big. But look at these two guys to the left and these to the right. These are some of the biggest heroes in football. But if you took the guys on the right and put them in a game with those guys on the left, that will be totally unequal because football has changed. Speed is faster. Pace is faster. Physical impression is faster. Technical things are different. And we also see that we changed another thing. We changed that all the equipment around and the way we participate in a soccer game is totally different. That is important because sales have had some of the same changes. And if we go away from sport, we can learn from other industries. This is the control tower of an airport. Try to imagine how much, how many procedures they have in an airport, how many processes they have described just because they want to reach a target saying 100% safety. They want to make sure that these flights are coming up and going down in a good way, no accidents, nothing going wrong. That's why they made procedures to perform all the time they want to perform. They evaluate this, and of course, people are taking care of these procedures. We can learn from that because I think that they're not satisfied with 98%. They're only satisfied with 100 and one of the big issues is, if you look around the world today, just a little more than 50% of salespeople actually reach their target. Just a little more than 50% of salespeople reach their target. That means something must be wrong. Either the budgeting, they just say yes to a budget and no, they wouldn't uh, get it. Or they say yes, but don't have the process and the capability to reach it. And if it was a manufacturing department in operations, we will never be satisfied with 53% reaching that target. We would have 100 reaching target. Quality-wise, we'll go for 98 or 99. But in sales and marketing, 
sometimes we accept that we only go with 60. We have to challenge ourselves and say, how can we actually go with 100? Because that's how we go beyond. And that means it has to matter for us. The same here. Try to take a look at the hospital. They will always be there to reach 100%. Do they some, sometimes not succeed? Yes, they do. Do they evaluate? Yes, they do. And they have a lot of data. That's why I want to inspire you today. How can we learn from sport? How can we learn from other businesses? How to improve our sales and marketing? Because it is possible. And a lot of things change for us. So today, we're going to look, understand that sales is just like sport, just like anything else. It's a performance game. But it's also a numbers game. I'll come back to that. We have to perform. And we have a lot of numbers, not just turnover, not just profit. We have a lot of other numbers that we can use. I'll show you that later on. That also means in some organizations, I've seen as a sales coach or sales consultant for many years, I've seen then in a lot of companies, unfortunately, sales turned into what I call a numbers game, only a numbers game. And it's not understanding that we have it's also a behavior game. And what do I mean by behavior? No athlete will win any gold medal if they don't have the right behavior at the right time. So it's not only a performance game, it's not only a numbers game, it's also a behavior game. How do we have the right behavior? Not the behavior of last year or 10 years back, but behavior we need today to challenge the, the, the present we are in. And then of course, a motivation game. I once met a, a, a CEO who said to me, I'm not really happy having salespeople visiting me. But there's one thing that I hate more than having salespeople visiting me. That's when I meet a depressed salesman. I need to meet somebody who is motivated, dedicated, and ready to do what they should. They should feel that they're ready. We will never see a 100-meter runner go into the athletes' stadium in Tokyo and not expecting to do the amazing thing. He might be nervous. He might know that he's not going to win, but he believe he can go beyond because it really matters. So by this, welcome so much to the game today. The game today, what I'm going to show you is, I'm going to talk about three topics. I'm going to talk about the customer journey versus the sales process. That's very important because it's a like, like in the hospital or the control tower. This is understanding the customer journey versus the sales process. We're going to go back to that in a minute. I'm going to talk about results versus behavior because a lot of sales and marketing directors, managers, they're so focused on results. I think you should focus more on behavior because behavior creates results. And then I'm going to talk about demotivation and motivation. And that's probably where you're really going to make big ears because uh, a lot of us need to understand how we motivate people and how we not are going to demotivate them. How can we actually create more motivation in our sales organization? Because sometimes, unfortunately, we kill it. We kill the motivation. And that's why we sometimes are struggling to get results and we are struggling to get changes. But I'll get back to that in a minute. But now I'm going to turn off my PowerPoint slides because I actually don't really like them. I hope you see my slide now. No, sorry, my screen now. And I hope you see my flip chart. We're going to look at these three things. We're going to look at the customer journey. We're going to look at the result versus the behavior. And we're going to look at the motivation. Where we start right now is we start with looking at what is actually being promoted as the most important tool for sales and marketing strategy? The most important tool in the sales and marketing strategy is the customer journey. What is a customer journey? Yeah, you can actually compare it a lot to what you did this summer if you did went on a holiday. You have to move from A to B. How do you start? What happening in the process? And how does it end? if it ever ends. The customer journey is actually the journey the customers travel when they want to buy your product or at least buy a similar product. That's where the journey starts. That's how they get information. That's how they make decision. And that's how they stick into your business. Customer journey has been uh, by a lot of big consulting companies in the world. It's been now promoted as the most single important tool for sales and marketing strategy. That means that means you have to understand. Can I please just uh, Shahista and Nabil, can you mute, please? Thank you. So the customer journey, 
Normally, people do it like a linear process, saying we start here and end here. That's one of the biggest mistakes in customer journey, because in my opinion, it never ends. That means we have to see it as it is. It's an infinity loop. It's a loop going on and going on and going on. This loop, we have to understand, it's not about the sales process. It's not about the sales people. This is about the journey of the client. It starts here and then it continues and hopefully it turns on and on and on. Just to explain it, here we talk about new clients and here we talk about existing clients. I'll explain that in a minute. But these are very important. And maybe already now you know that you are challenged by existing clients. You don't do enough cross-selling or upselling or more selling, or you know that you have too big a churn, meaning that you are losing too many of your existing clients. Or maybe some of you know that the inflow of uh, the acquisition, getting new clients is not good enough. Now you have to focus here. So actually on these like glasses here, you can focus where you wanna go or you can focus on how you actually structure your organization. I'll come back to that. But this is 100% understanding the journey of the client. And the journey can be divided into some areas. And these areas are very important to understand. And we understand it by, because we talk a lot about B2B and B2C, but actually we are selling people to people, human to human. Of course, it's more complicated in business to business sometimes. It can be very complicated in B2C business to consumers because man and husband and children need to agree what should we buy. But this is actually the journey they start. And normally the journey starts by being triggered. Triggered means that I'm ready and I get curious and I get inspired. That's actually what all of you have expired, experienced here because we triggered you on LinkedIn. We engaged with you. And at that time you saw the headline saying, it's time to come back and get sales and marketing up and running. Some of you said, wow, that's interesting. I wanna know a little more about that. So what you did is actually you engaged with us and you, got, you don't have a need yet, but you have something that you find interesting. It's the same what you see today is when somebody uh, are looking to buy anything, we sometimes get triggered. Sometimes we have a need, sometimes we just get triggered by something we see on social media, or we see it in LinkedIn, or we see it in an email, or we see it actually uh, driving down the, the, the main road in our city, we see a billboard saying, wow, I could use that. Or we get a need because our printer solution is going down, or we need a new web page, we are triggered by a need. When we go from this, we go into awareness stage. In awareness stage, we are from the beginning unaware to be very aware. And I think you all know that when we start being in an awareness phase, we start getting information, we're searching Google, we're speaking with friends, and then we get a lot of information. And at that time, when we have a decent portion of information, what's happening now is that we convert into an evaluation phase. Evaluation means I'm now looking for the right supplier. I go from a phase where I Google and search my information, whatever business you're in, then I turn into a position where I'm looking maybe at three potential suppliers. And then in the end, I choose one. And this phase is, is very important to understand because today we know, we know that 73% of the salespeople's activity towards the client is out of scope where the client is in the customer journey. So understanding this, and let's just start here, understanding how our clients are getting information, searching information, getting to know products, getting to know us. We need to understand what they do. And we can easily do it because we can go out and speak with maybe five or 10 of our existing clients and ask them, if you have a problem with this, where do you look for information? Where did you get inspiration? Do you contact sales people or do you speak with people on social media? Do you speak with your network? What do you actually do? I just worked with a company that sell ice cream machines, big ice cream machines. And sometimes they said, how do they actually search? Because we only like three to five suppliers in the world. But what is interesting is there's a lot of people in the organization deciding who they should go with. And what they do is the trigger here can be machine or slow, 
They want to create new ice creams. They want to do something different or production is too much, they're too, too overloaded. So the trigger is that there is a problem. Now they start having information. Some of it personally, some of it social media, and then they choose to go with one or two or three, normally only two suppliers. That means out of five, three are thrown away. And then they go with the two and speak with them. And then hopefully, if we are strong enough here, people, the, the customers get ready to make decision. And decision means buy. This is what we can call the turning point. But what we have to understand is this process here is important because we influence the client in the right way. We, we, we actually have a lot of chances to speak with them, not, on, not necessarily personally, but also in the internet, social media, like that. At that time, when they do decision and they say, yes, we're ready to buy from you, it changes into that we are onboarding our clients. We're onboarding them to get success with the solution. Now it turns into service department, technical department, invoicing department, a lot of things here happening. And the, the client get more and more mature to understand how it is to work with us. A lot of companies are so focused to get new clients that they totally forget the onboarding process. Remember how expensive it is to get a client and then we forget the onboarding process. And the onboarding process is actually where the client gets success with the buying of a product or solution. And then at that time, when they really get that success, we are heating them up to get more loyalty and we can sell new products, more solutions, services. And what we can hope for is that when they at a certain time, when we create that loyalty, they don't go out in the market again, they turn around and buy from us once again, and once again, and once again. That's why it's so important to understand not our process, but what is important for the client, what is important for our customers. That's why I'm gonna take now the infinity loop. The infinity loop is a process where we trigger, we create awareness, we get them to evaluate, they make decision, they onboard it, we create loyalty. But let's try to take it and spread it out because you can really use this. This is now the infinity loop made in a linear process. Creating here with the trigger, the awareness, evaluation, buying process, onboarding, and loyalty. This is exactly the same process, but now it's linear. That means we can now start understanding the customer journey, understanding what do the client hear? What do they actually do when they are triggered? Where do they search information? How do they, where do they go if they want to have more awareness, understanding? What do they do when they evaluate? How do they actually act when they buy? What is the most important thing for them? Normally what we see is that all salespeople think that price is the most important thing. We all know it isn't. Price is one thing, only one part of the product. If I don't see value, then low price is still expensive. If I see value, then high price is still cheap. So what we need to understand is what do our clients actually do when they have this journey? And if we don't know this, we cannot divide this into what part of this is responsibility because now we're gonna talk about responsibility. Who's responsible here? Is it sales or marketing? Is it sales or marketing? And then we come to the buying process, sales, marketing, service, sales, after sales service, marketing again, after sales service. Now we can divide it if we know our organization. And that's one of the major issues because we don't know the customer journey. We cannot agree who does actually do what. That's a very important part when we do this. That is to define our process, not defining it in the traditional way. Because in the traditional way, what do we do? Yeah, you can ask yourself a question now. I said you have a pen and paper. Please write down how strong, how, how well known is the sales process actually in your organization? How strong is the connection between sales and marketing in that process? Because what I've seen is when you're creating responsibility and you're defining what I call what, why, how, who, and when, then you design a process 
what to do in all stages. But in a lot of companies, this is one of the biggest issue. We haven't aligned sales, marketing, and service, just to make it very simple, three departments. There could be a lot of other departments included. We haven't aligned the company. So sales is sometimes actually struggling with internal issues. Marketing are trying to do the best, but there's a bad handover from marketing to sales. So we have to define this process as a linear process saying we understand the journey because it's all starting with the customer journey. It's starting understanding the behavior of the client, understanding the customer's behavior. Then we can talk about who are responsible and we can talk about what to do, why to do, how to do, who should do it and when. Because in that case, we're starting creating a sales team. And sales is no longer for a lonely wolf. Of course, the sales guy has some responsibility for something. The service guy has something. The marketing people have some responsibility. But to create the best handover, because that's where we connect these processes. How is the handover? When marketing create a campaign, they create a lead. And where, how do we hand it over to sales? This process is by far shown to be one of the most important processes to have a control over and understanding in, in any sales organization. And a lot of companies could gain from just defining this, understanding this, and it changed a lot. And why did it change? It changed because just five or 10 years ago, especially in the B2B, just five years ago, a lot of, a lot of customers, they were waiting for the salesman to show up with new products. Today, they're not waiting. They're Googling, they're searching, and they are very, very strong in just getting that information. The power actually turned from the sales guy to the buyers. The buyer has the power because they can get all this information. That means we have to design the sales process in a different way. And we have to understand it all starts with the customer journey. And then it starts with what it called the touch point. The touch points come from here. That's where and how and when we touch the customer. The touch points are the key to success. This is the first part of today's lesson. If you don't understand the journey well enough and you haven't defined the sales process good enough with an approach of the customer journey, then start there. Because today you're probably wasting a lot of time. And the big problem is that when you're not getting your results, normally what people say is not do different, they say do more. And I'll show you what I mean, because now we move from the first topic, customer journey was a sales process. This has to be aligned. We move into the second game, results versus behavior. I'm going to give you a little example of one of my clients. Results versus behavior is very interesting. This tool is probably the most important tool for any sales and marketing or service leader, manager, or salesperson to understand. This is the tool that can help you to get success. It's called the tuning fork. And the tuning fork, actually, you all know, if you play the piano, you tune the piano to play the right tone. I cannot hear it because I'm a very bad, I'm a very bad musician. But all musicians on a certain level, they know if they don't tune it in the right way, it sounds odd. That's the same with sales. You have to tune it. And let me show what is actually the tuning fork. The tuning fork is that as a salesperson, as a sales team, as a sales company, we create results. These results can be the profit, the revenue, how many new clients, what kind of product we sell. It can be the product mix, and can be ABC clients, it can be anything. These are the KPIs that we are measured upon. But we all know that KPIs are great, but KPIs are created by something different. And let me give you an example. I once worked with a company. They were selling machines. These machines, they sold a lot of these machines every year, every month, every quarter. They measured, of course, how many machines do we sell, what is the profit, and so on. Then they developed a new service contract. Normally, a service was not sold together with the machines, but what they did is they wanted to sell more service because they could see that the profit on the machines themselves were under pressure. So they created an amazing service contract. That service contract was actually developed because they could see that the clients wanted to have more service to, to maintain in the company, to stay in the company, to buy the next order. 
So service was here a part of the journey of the client. The, cu the customers wanted that service to be easy and smooth and get it. So they created here a new product that could be used in new selling and acquisition, but also in more selling. The service product was to keep the to keep the clients not churning, but to keep them in the company as a buying client. What they did was also they said, of course, they put up some KPIs for selling these service agreements. So what they did is they didn't know what to do, so they put up a number they wanted to reach. And I'm just I'm just putting up a number to show you the idea of the tuning fork. They wanted to sell 10 service agreements in a certain period. It could be a week, it could be a month, it would go a quarter. Just put it in your own business, what it is you want to sell. This was the number 10, they wanted to sell 10. They also said to create a result of 10 sold service agreements, we need to focus on one very important thing, our efforts. Efforts means our activities. Do we actually present the service agreement? I think a lot of companies has developed a new product. It could be a real physical product or more uh, uh, like a service agreement, but we have created products that are not being sold. Then the sales people conclude, customers are not interested. Maybe the interest is because we didn't present it. So what they said here is we need to do the effort. The first part here is what is called quantity. We need to do a certain number of efforts if we want to sell like 10. And the smart guy in the class now said, yeah, at least they need to do 10 to sell 10. And they probably need to do more than 10 to sell 10. So first part here is to understand quantity is a part of the algorithm to create a result. Then we have the second part, priority. And that's what they saw that this service agreement was for a specific kind of machines. Some other machines, it didn't really fit for them because some of them were too small, some of them were too big, too individual. So they had a certain kind of machine that this service agreement really did fit for. So it should be easy. We talk about what is called sales enablement. It should be easy for the sales guy and the marketing guy to promote the service agreement and to sell it. So actually where we started here is, that now we know effort is important for results. So what they decided in that company was that when we evaluate the period and the result, we want to do what is called 100% effort. 100% means that every time we sell a certain kind of machine in this offer, in the quotation to the client, we always present that service agreement. Then they started doing. Now they said, we agreed, committed on 100% effort, and we agreed that we're going for 10. After a period, they ended up, the period was over, and they sold five. I think all of us being in sales know that there are two approaches to this. Somebody saying, I know budget was too high. Somebody saying, it's never going to happen. And somebody saying, OK, let's start again. Let's try it. But if you look at sport, they are looking at a lot of numbers. They're looking at a lot of game data. We could do the same because we all only know one thing. We know that we had a budget of 10 and we sold five. We don't know anything about the effort. So what we can do now is we could take a look and I give you now a number here. In this period, they sold 40 machines. That means they sold 40 machines in the same period, but they only sold five service agreements. So there was a lot of opportunities. But what was more important was that only in 20 of the offers did they present the service agreement. That means potential there was 40, 20 times they presented the service agreement. <laughs> Qui te serait les plantes directement. Je te dis que tu sois un MND Lomb, ça Tu serais les belles. Bien sûr, on peut. Je pense que c'est fini maintenant. Donc, 40 opportunités, 20 fois qu'ils ont pris la chance et ils ont scoré 5 fois. C'est juste comme un striker en football. 40 fois qu'on a essayé de jouer, 20 fois qu'il a tiré dans le goal, 5 fois qu'il a scoré. Et ce qu'on a maintenant, c'est ce qu'on appelle le hit rate. Le hit rate est que 25% des offres tournent dans un service agreement. So what they looked at here is the biggest problem is actually not the hit rate. The biggest problem is that they agreed on 100%, but 
but they only did 50. This is a big problem because I think all of you in sales and marketing has seen this before. We try to agree that we should present this product, we should do something, but we don't succeed. And normally what happens is we conclude customers don't like our product or we are too high priced or anything else. This is not the problem. There was a lot of opportunities, but they didn't know how to hit them. So what they agreed upon is don't lower the budget. That's normally what we do. Next period, we cannot go for 10, we go for five. No, they kept on saying next period, once again, we go for 10. And this time, 100% is non-discussable. This is the most important thing. We want to reach 100% effort because if they did that the last time, what happened here? They would have reached it, but they didn't do it. This was the problem actually, the 50%. So they kept this, they kept the 10 as the goal. And then they agreed in the sales organization, they spoke about this, they spoke about what they could do, and then they started. And then after this period ended, they reached seven. Somebody would be depressed. Somebody would be positive. Actually, it was 40% higher than last period, so it's going better. But as a sales organization that wants to really go beyond when it matters, they're not really only looking at this. They want to look at this. And just to give you a comparison, in the same period here, what happened? Once again, they sold seven machines. They had 40 so, sorry, they had 40 offers, they did. But what was important is they also presented 40 times service agreement. That means first time, now they can say we did 100%. We did what we promised to do. We did what was the commitment. And then comes the but or the or. The or is, but actually hit rate went down from 25 because this time only 40 proposals ended up in seven sales, and that's going down to around 18%. Now we can look about the X factor in sales. A lot of salespeople around the world, especially a lot of sales managers, they try to control the sales organization by profit and by effort. Now it comes down to the X factor, what is called efficiency. Efficiency is not talking about how much you do, and what we prioritize, we're now talking about quality and we're talking about behavior. Now we're talking about sales competences. Now we're talking about how strong you are in your sales efficiency. You can compare this to you have a chance to knock somebody in a boxing match. How strong are you to do the right knock, to do the right thing? And this is the same in selling. We see here that to do, actually they could have sold 40 service agreements. They only sold seven. Why? Because what we have to work with now, we have to work what should be the capabilities and the competences of the sales organization. That's where we log into behavior. How strong are we in presenting the product? How strong are we in handling objections? How strong are we in argumentation? How strong are we in closing the deal? How strong are we in creating value for the client and showing them the value of the service agreement? What we saw there was they tried to do efforts, but some of them were really not with efficiency. Just give an example. Some of them were in a meeting with a client saying, oh, you want our machine, that's great. We have a service agreement. Do you want to spend 20,000 US dollars for that in a year? And the client said, no, I don't need that. It's a brand new machine. Somebody said, you probably don't need a service agreement. You have your own technicians, right? Bad way of presenting a product. The best one of them said, how important is this product actually for your manufacturing and your operations? And the client said, oh, it's very important. What happens if it's down for like a day or two? Wow, that's a huge problem because we're losing turnover, we're losing profit, and we get bad customer experience. So how much value will it actually create for you if you could have a service agreement saying that you're up and running in one hour? Wow, that's important for us. What would it create for you? Now, this is theoretically, but this is why we have the training, the practice in behavior. How do you want your sales guy to play the game? And unfortunately, what we see is a lot of sales organization is not led by the tuning fork. They are led by efforts. And they should every day report how many meetings did you have, how many people did you contact, and 
Who did you contact? They put in reports every day, every week, every month. Nobody use it for development. Nobody use it to train the behavior. And if you were an athlete playing in the Tokyo Olympics, what would happen is that you, of course, you look at how much effort you put into your training, but you put everything into behavior. You address it on video, you see your games, you evaluate, you train again. So what is important here is to understand, if you really, really want to do this, you have to understand to create, how do we want to play sales game? How do we present products? How strong are we in objections? And if you don't define the quality of your sales game, then you have a problem. I will show it for you. So for you, of course, to all of you, those who want to have the slides, and I'll give you a slide deck with the models, you'll get that. In a little later on, Alvin will present you for some forms because what we're going to give away today is, of course, you can have the presentation, but you also have the access because I'm giving away uh, 10 live workshops with your organization. In 60 minutes, we're going to look into how you can improve. And I'll show you what you can learn to improve because you can learn, first of all, how could we get started with the customer journey? How could we actually get into defining our sales process with the approach of understanding a customer journey? How can we measure our sales organization, not only on what I call the most naive way, understanding that effort is a basic to have a sales result, but behavior is the key to optimization. And if you look at, if you go into a, a manufacturing department, looking at lean or Kaizen or whatever, one thing is time and effort, but they look into behavior. 99% of optimization here comes from behavior change. That's the same in sense. How can we train people to go out there and be amazing? That we can do when they're really motivated. But we come back to that. But you'll be presented to have the opportunity to get the slides and also a free, 10 of you can get a free workshop, live event, where we'll look into your company exactly. But to understand this about behavior, you need to understand this the ladder of the order. What is the way to have the order? This is a very, very easy tool to understand, but please use it in the right way. Here, we get one new customer. That is, of course, the goal of any sales organization, to have customers, but also to have the right ones. The right ones in your organization, I don't know, but the problem is if your sales and marketing and service is not aligned about what is the right clients, then it's a problem. That can be in a certain industry, it can be the size of the client, it can be anything, but we have to have customers. Everything here starts with a lead. And these leads, they come into the funnel, brought in by maybe marketing, maybe by salespeople, different channels bring them in. And then what we do is we contact them. I'll give you another example here from one of my clients. I work with a company that they actually haven't defined the dream customer, the ideal customer. They haven't defined that. They didn't do a playbook. What is very important today to have a playbook. How do we play our sales? What is the ideal customer, the dream customer? And how do we create leads? And what do we do when, when we get the leads? Who, who, which of the leads do we contact? And what do we say? After having contact, what they found out was there was normally a for, first meeting where they uncovered the needs, understand the client, presented the company, and then a second meeting where they actually presented a proposal and hopefully closed a deal. So this was the normal and ideal way to a customer. Of course, sometimes there was a third meeting and a fourth meeting and some of them joined. But when I asked them another question, do you know how many of these, do you know the process, how many meetings you need, how many leads you need to get a client? They were quiet, nothing they said. So first of all, I asked them, what is an average order with you, an average customer? We found out that 10,000 US dollars was the average order. They had to reach 1 million US dollar in a year. And it's very important. Now we know they have to get 100 new clients. This was the profit here, not the revenue. And this was the profit. That doesn't matter. It's the same. But they had to reach this. So now we know they had to win 100 orders to get this target here. Then I asked them another question. Okay, then to get one of these, what is then the process here? How many of your second meetings actually turn into order? And they said, wow, that's a good question. They didn't know. So for a period, we recorded these data. We looked upon this and they found out actually that three second meetings 
was what they needed to close one deal. So three times they presented a proposal, two said no, one said yes. They also find out that first meetings, every second first meeting turned into a second meeting that turned into an order. That means now we could see that they need two client meetings here to get one second meeting, and then they had three of them to get one here. And then we had the contact. They had the list of leads, and they could see that they needed to call five to get a meeting. Five contacts to get one first meeting, two first meetings to get one second meeting, three second meetings to get one order. What is interesting now is that we can now multiply this because now we know one, three, this makes six here, 30 leads they need to get one new client. That means to get 100, we can multiply this by 100, 3,000 leads to do this. When we look upon this, some of them said, wow, I'm out of this. We cannot do it. On the other hand, we can turn it around and say, ah, how can we actually develop? If you were an athlete going to the Olympics, that you really wanted to win the Olympics, you would probably look, how can I improve? How can I have progress? So what we actually looked upon here is that we, we are now looking into how can we actually maybe be stronger in the second meeting to go down to two? And how can we maybe be stronger here to go down to three? Just a goal, could be anywhere. Also, that's one of the things. If we could do that, it's only one, two, four, three, and we're down to 12. If you're down to 12, we're down to 1,200 leads. And what they also find out is that the spread, the spread of the, the, the profit here came from 1,000 to 100,000 profit US dollars. That means if they spend too much time on $1,000 profit, net profit orders, they spend the time bad. If they could have more like 50 or 70 or 100,000, it would be easier to reach target. But nobody ever interested for quantity, priority, and behavior. They were only interested in quantity. And what is interesting here is, we know that budget goes higher and higher and higher. But if they wanted to reach more here, they have to have more leads, more meetings. It's impossible. And normally what the sales manager said to me, I need more salespeople. I said, no, you need salespeople that work in the right way, that have the right behavior, the right attitude, the right motivation, the right skills, and the right process. So now we come back here. In one page, we can actually now define, we know the customer's journey. That's a little like here. What are they doing here? We know the sales process. We know what should we do? Why should we do? How should we do? What they found out was actually sometimes when a client that was too small contacted them, somebody called and they will never get more than maybe 1,000 in a net profit. They learned to say no with a yes. They learned how to handle them faster. They learned how to close the deals. And actually what they found out is, we don't need to go on a visit. We have somebody who closed the deals on the phone. But that's what we can do when we understand the data, when we understand that the performance more than just on the KPI result, but also here on the effort and the efficiency. But that means we are no longer just happy go lucky sales organization, sales and marketing. We need to understand also what kind of lead do we actually convert into meetings? Because then marketing can help us to get in touch with the right leads not the wrong ones. And then we go back again to the infinity loop. The infinity loop start everything because how do we trigger that kind of client that we want? How do we set down sales and marketing together to speak how we can get the right clients? How can we convert them? What is the message we need to approach them with? And we maybe speak sales and service. How can we maintain them and sell more so we can earn more money on our clients? But that's because it's a team's game. It's no longer a one man's band. It's not a lonely wolf. We play this together. And then I'll just shortly show you again the tuning fork. Because the tuning fork actually has one more aspect. Here we have it. The result comes here. The result comes from effort. 
and efficiency. How much you do, what you do, and how good you are. That's actually very easy. But in the middle, we had one more thing. We have the heart and the head of the sales organization. And what do I mean by that? In a lot of sales organizations, we plan the process, we plan the quantity, we plan the budget, we plan the behavior, but we don't create the right mindset. And mindset is everything. I think that if we look at the Olympics, all these athletes, they knew the mindset was so important because most of them were pretty good at rowing a boat, running a hundred meter, playing the tennis, whatever. They're pretty good. The winner is definitely the one with the right mindset. That's the same in sales. We need a mindset, a mindset combined with heart and head, understanding and motivation. So what I'm gonna show you now is the last tool. But before that, I know that I promised you a gift. And one of the gifts is that we today give away 10 live workshops where you, maybe a couple of people from your company can, uh, can um, participate, get me to participate in a free workshop with your company, dedicated to look upon exactly your customer journey, the sales process in your company. And Alvin, I know that you shared a, a link for form, right? Alvin, are you here with me? Okay, I know that he shared a link uh, in the chat that you can go and- uh, Yeah, I'm here. Oh, great, Alvin. Yeah. There's a link to the form, right? Yeah, that's the link. Uh, anyone who's interested, they can just fill the form over there. Yes, so in the chat, there is a link to a form. If you want to participate or be the lucky winner of one of these workshops, please sign up there. We give away 10 for today. Also, if you want to have the, the we give away a couple of white papers and uh, then you, are, you can have that. Please sign up there and then hopefully I'll meet you again in a more in team uh, work where we can sh look upon exactly your condition, your situation. But to understand this, we are looking on the most important tool. I showed you the customer journey. That's very important. I showed you the tuning fork. That's very important. Now we look on in the last tool here. And the last tool is that results are created by action. What is interesting is action. That's what we do. And I know that if some of us try to go on a diet or some of us try to be stronger in running or strong, more fit, we all know that the result of the body comes from action, maybe too little action, wrong action, eating instead of exercising or whatever. Action is the key to results. But we also know that the action comes from emotions. Emotions, that means do I feel good or bad? Emotion comes from, do I really believe or not? I wanna go back to an example I gave you earlier. Maybe you remember, they wanted to sell a new service agreement. They put up a budget of 10 and they reached a budget, sorry, they reached the result of five. What kind of emotion comes into the mind of that people? Do we see it as a challenge to go for 10? Do we see it as a challenge now to lower the budget? What kind of emotion do we get? That emotion is created by our thinking. Thinking is very interesting. We all know if we can think positive, we can feel positive, we can act positive, we can create results. In a lot of sales organizations, we are now struggling. What track do we follow? This is simple. Those of you who participated in my uh, live event earlier about uh, uh, neuroscience selling, they have seen this before. Those of you who want to participate that, you can write in the chat, yes, please, I know to more, know more about neuroscience selling. We'll come back with that a little later. Neuroscience selling is understanding the brain of the customer, but it's also understanding our own brain. That means how can we actually create results that are better than expected? How can we not be afraid of the goal? How can we actually love to hit it? Those guys going to talk to you, those girls going to talk to you to win, they had no problem. They all wanted to win. So what is interesting here is action created by emotions, created by thinking. And here we can be on what I call the black or the green track. Black track is negative thinking. 
It's not possible. Clients don't want it. Price is always the problem. Competitors are better than us. Our process is too, too, too complicated. We think negative. And when we start thinking negative, we create black emotions. And black emotion is that we are not happy. We are afraid. We are frightened. We feel frustrated. And people that are frustrated will never succeed. Of course, we feel nervous, but we have to feel that we can do the best and then create results. So what we see here is bad thinking creates bad feeling, bad action, bad result. So what we need to change is we need to change the mentality in our sales organization. I just worked with a group of industrial salespeople. And what they said to me is, oh, Max, we have such a big problem. The most difficult thing is not winning the order. We can beat our competitor, but beating the internal procedure is a problem. So they were getting afraid of winning orders because internal procedure was a problem. Maybe they're right, I don't know. But at least, how can they think that way? They need to be happy to win orders and then, of course, internally work together to make procedures, compliance, KYC, whatever, make it more easy to do because they can do nothing about it. They need to learn how to handle it. That's one of the most important things because chemistry in the brain is that when you're on the black track, you get a lot of cortisol and adrenaline. It's stress hormones. Stress hormones are bad because nobody wants to be in a room with somebody who's un unhappy. Everybody wants to be with somebody who is happy and self-confident. So you need to learn an organization. I, I, once again, you present a new product. A new product is a change. A change you don't like unless you train it. And when you train it, you get a better competence. You get a stronger feeling of security. You get better to doing it. That means you need to understand that the tuning fork is not only about putting up result or goals. It's also about defining the efforts and defining efficiency. Because in that way, what we can do is we can create a green track. Green track is positive mindset. Green track is good feeling. Good feeling creates good action. Good action creates better results. And what's happening here is that we know when you are on that green track, there are two things in your brain that are very important here. The first part in the brain is that you actually, when you do your effort, when you do your things, you, you release endorphins and dopamines. That's also what you re re release when you eat or when you do fitness, you release that. That means just from doing, you create that. But when we can create also that we are together, we are a group of salespeople. We are together in sales and marketing. We are together in sales and service and marketing. What you can do is you can create an organization with a higher degree of social understanding. And that actually releases what is called serotonin and especially oxytocin. These are the, what is called the happiness drugs in our brain. And if we can create an organization, because in any organization, it's impossible to believe that we are not put on the black track. We, be, we will be put on the black track. We lose a client. Uh, we lose a sales guy. We have a bad product. We have delivery problems. All this is coming to us. It's not the problem that it's coming. It's the approach we have when it arrives. Do we, do we, do we approach it with a black mindset? Oh, it's a problem. Management don't know. Clients don't want. Com uh, competitors are more uh, cheaper than us. They give a discount. No, people. It's about your mindset. It's about how we approach it because I know that all these guys in Tokyo, all these guys in football, all these guys in any industry, they have challenges. So what is happening here is that it's very difficult to be on the black track because you don't create creativity, you don't create high performance. High performance is created here. So what you can do instead is, okay, let's speak about how can we handle it? What can we do? That's actually what happened with these guys I showed you here. They looked into this. And when they saw the first figure of 3,000 leads to create this, they said, oh no, Mats, it's impossible. And then I said, okay, always look at the bright side, guys. Let's turn it around and let's see what is possible, not what is impossible. Impossible actually says, I am possible. <laughs> and that's what we can look upon. How do I make it possible? 
And then we learned how to have the best second meetings, how to present the proposal, how to have the best third meeting, how to take the best contact to relevant leads instead of irrelevant leads. Because if I only get a thousand in a profit, I need to run tremendously fast. But if I can get more than a hundred thousand, I can actually go down to only winning 10 orders to reach my budget. So here we talk about mindset in an organization. So just to sum this up, three things that you should and work with and understand. Understand the customer journey and put it into your sales process. That is so important. If you haven't spent time here, it creates more understanding, it creates opportunities. Two, understand that sales comes from effort and efficiency. So please work with the tuning fork, not only measuring meetings and contacts, also measuring priority and especially working with behavior because behavior is what creates results. Not only effort, behavior, the right behavior, quality in behavior. And then of course, in the end, always try to work with the green track. Remember, it's human being sometimes to go on the black track. Somebody normally said to me, Matt, are you never on a black track? Of course I am. But it's a mentality to define that when I'm on the black track, I want to look to how to go to the green track. That's what you can decide. And that's actually the three keys that I want to give you when you have to get your team up and running again now to be ready for sales and marketing after the summer. Define and be interested in the customer journey and the sales process. Try to find out how you can measure and tune your organization with the tuning fork, and then create a green mindset in your organization. And if anybody had any questions, any questions, any comments, you can write it in the chat. Uh, if you want to give me some feedback in the chat, please do it. On the other hand, what will happen is that all of you are so you're so allowed to contact me. And what we're going to do is we're also going to present some of you for a special program that we're going to do for sales performance to develop this because we're going to do a longer program. Uh, because what we see is if I go back to the athletes, if I wanted to participate in the Olympics, I might have been practicing for four to five years. So I cannot expect that even in one day, I changed all my selling. That's the same here. We need to change over time. So what we're going to do is we're going to present you for a program that you can actually participate in for a period of like 12 months, where we have frequently continuous improvement going on. And by this, I just want to thank you all. And I want to wish you all an amazing day. But please be aware of one thing. You define and decide if you want to stay on the green track and do that, please. Take care, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the day and you got some good, uh, good input from here. Take care. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Matt. Thank You're you, welcome. Matt. Thank you. So Thanks, much. Matt. It's amazing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Amazing session, Matt. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, sir.